All right, here we are, another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kudair. And today it's a bit of a different episode. We actually are not joined by a business, but someone that I really kind of admire. Aya Shalak, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, good. So Aya, the reason why I bring you on the show and I wanted to kind of uh, let the audience know, uh, I've been following your Reflective Odysseys podcast, which is a fantastic podcast. The reason why I'm bringing Aya on the show is because mental health to me is one of the most important things. And what I'd like to do today is I'd like to kind of divulge a little bit more about the show, what you do, uh, your background a little bit, and why is it important that health, you know, mental health in general is something that we all should be looking into. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start at the beginning, start at the top by asking you a little bit more about the show. About the show. Yeah. Okay. Tell me like a little bit more about the premise of the show, why you started it and all of those good things. Honestly, I was scrolling on Instagram one day and so all of a sudden podcasts became a trend. We saw this huge surge of podcasts and mm -hmm. what's nice about podcasts is that anyone could start one. You don't have to have a certain qualification or go to a certain school. Yeah. Or, <laughs> not that you're not qualified. That's not what we're saying. <laughs> but I saw that there was a lot of similarities of the things that were being put out there and a lot of it was negative. It was more of, oh, this is how I'm rich. This is how I'm successful. And most of these people were actually Nepo babies. They yeah. weren't people that did actually start from the bottom. So it was kind of setting an unrealistic expectation and giving people some source of negativity and hopelessness of like, oh, I can never get there. Yeah. And even if I wanted to, the road seems so difficult. And it's not like these people that called themselves role models were giving any type of tips or roadmaps for people to achieve that. It was more of, self-validation mm -hmm. uh, for to boost their own egos or to promote their businesses so I, I said to myself we need something that touches people we need something that connects humans together and the one thing that we actually share from the beginning of time across all cultures all races our religions is that we are storytellers and that's how culture remain till this day that's how traditions and morals and principles have been passed down through storytelling so when you bring a person and you ask them about themselves and the struggles that they had and the experiences that they've gone through, not only does it make them feel validated, but it also makes the person behind the screen watching feel that the things that they've been through are also validated and they're not alone. And I wanted it to be in an unfiltered, authentic lens. And that's where the name comes from. Reflective, where we reflect on how we got here, what happened, how did these experiences shape us? Because when something happens to you because we're a result of nature and nurture. When you go through something, you have a decision. You either let it define you or yep. you define it and you kind of take agency and ownership of your own life and your own experiences. So we were bringing on people that were not necessarily famous or celebrities to help and to help boost the podcast per se. It was more people that I personally knew. So the honesty was there. The, the authenticity was there. And they were talking about rock bottom and how they went from rock bottom to where they got today, sharing the tips and sharing the experience and whatnot. And it was helping people on the other side, connecting like, oh, I'm actually not alone. This person was exactly at the spot that I am at today and look where they are. Maybe I can get there too. And the minute we started, we got a lot of DMs and a lot of messages from people. Oh, I've been through this too. Paragraphs on paragraphs on paragraphs and people wanting to share their experiences. And that's where the Odyssey came in, which means story and Greek mythology and then you put that all together and it's breaking down the stigma of mental health. Tell me a little bit more about your qualification. Why do you think you're qualified to run a show like that? Well, first of all, I have eight years of experience in mental health. I feel like in the Middle East, I've seen about everything there is to see when it comes to yep. <laughs> when it comes to mental health. I mean, the minute you're you're Middle Eastern uh, or you come from an Arab household, you're good to go. You already stamped with trauma. <laughs> <laughs> you, you graduated from the school of trauma. But then also, like I've worked in men's prisons, I've worked in war zones, I've worked in human trafficking and shelters. You, you know, I've seen different forms of therapy and how applying these different forms of therapy affect people depending on, you know, where they're coming from and their background and whatnot. Uh, but also, you know, let's talk a little bit academically. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology. I double majored in psychosocial studies as well. Um, and I've done over 10 certifications when it comes to mental health interventions in cases of emergencies, healing people with trauma. So you got the academic part and then you got the, the life part in the eight years of experience. But then also I'm a people's person, not to toot my own horn, but I feel like my best quality is my ability to connect with people and make them feel comfortable. Yeah. One thing that like, I really gathered about you from the moment we met, it's that empathy. Like you have this, I'm like right away, I'm like, this person is a very much of an empath. Thank you. And I, I could tell like right away, I could just like literally tell you everything. <laughs> 
tell you the story about how I felt, what happened. I remember. <laughs> it was insane. So because of that, I was like, well, no, you have to come on my show. You, like, we got to talk about mental health. It's something that's really, like I said, near and dear to my heart because of the fact that we've all gone through trauma. Like you said earlier, how you go through and, and kind of which side you choose, you're always one, you're always at a fork in the road. Right? Exactly. You're always going to have that choice to make one way or another, which way am I going to take? It's going to affect the rest of your life. Exactly. So tell me a little bit of a story about, you know, a situation that you were in from your experience back in Lebanon. Like work-wise or personal-wise? Work-wise. Oh, so... The One thing of the stories you shared that was really, really cool about some of the kids. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't say cool. Cool is not really a good way to describe it. I think it's very heartwarming to see kind of the, the you know, the change. Honestly, I forgot which story I told you, but I know oh, that... there's so many of them. Yeah, I think that there's so many. But honestly, my favorite work experience or life experience uh, was when I was working with Palestinian uh, youth at risk of delinquency. Talk uh, about trauma. Coming, <laughs> <laughs> talk about trauma. Coming from marginalized uh, communities. And the interesting thing is when you're a product of war or product of asylum and refuge, you kind of inherit some type of generational trauma. Yeah. So you kind of have a DNA predisposition uh, for certain mental health disorders. But then also you're then put in a society and a community that does not give you a fighting chance and all the odds are against you. You got a recipe for disaster. So the place where I was working at, actually no one wanted to work there. And the specific group of individuals I was working with, also no one wanted to work with them. But I was like, okay, let's do this. And challenge it, accepted. Challenge accepted. There you go. <laughs> And, and they were all taller than me. They were all bigger than me. Their voices were loud. Some of them were wearing knives on their necks. And I was like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? But the interesting thing is that I walked into the class and we just started playing. We did role play. We were joking around. They were making fun of me. I was joining in the laughter. And we kind of formed that, that little bond with each other. But one time we were talking about emotions and feelings. And the interesting thing was me seeing their shock. As if I was, I was speaking a different language. Like, what are you talking? I have the right to feel this way. Mm -hmm. There is a difference between sadness and anger and frustration. And it's not all the same thing. And then we were talking about uh, hugs and physical touch, which is also a taboo because uh, you know you have also some like traditions and some uh, religious you know conservation. And then we were talking about hugs and whatnot. And one of the kids who was six years old came up to me and he was like, "I don't know what a hug is." Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, you keep telling me, like, hug, hug, and I see people do it, but I don't know how it feels. Yeah. And in that, like, I got so emotional, but I was, I was trying my best to control myself because you don't want them to feel, because they read, they read your body language because they don't communicate in, in, in their households. So they read your body language and immediately they, they'll be taken aback if you react a certain way. And I, I was trying my best to, to control myself. Just remembering it, it, it takes me back. And I was like, I, like, I can give you a hug. And he, he looked at me, he's like, like, oh, you would do that for me. Like, it was this, like, big deal. And I gave him a hug, and the minute I hugged him, he started crying. And he didn't understand why he was crying. It was just, it was kind of his body's response yeah. to this physical touch that he has never experienced. Uh, maybe it was an oversurge of oxytocin, I don't know, the, the cuddle hormone. But he just shattered, just cried. Uh, but then a couple of days later, I, I would see the students hug each other when they would, when they would come back uh, to school mm -hmm. in the morning. Mm -hmm. It's very heartwarming to see, especially like when you've gone through war and trauma, you become like this kind of rock, yeah. right? And then you, you're putting in, you're literally putting on an act for the people because you don't want to see, like you don't want them to see that sort of weak. And it's not just internal. towards the, it's not just towards the people, it's towards your, towards yourself as well. Like even I remember uh, I was working the, at a, it was kind of like a shelter for kids that parents just gave up. It wasn't even a typical orphanage or a boarding school or anything. It was just a place where these children found themselves at. And uh, we were talking and we found out that they were self-harming. They were using razors, getting the razors. They're so smart. They even found creativity in harming themselves. It's crazy like how powerful the brain can be even when you're a child. They found a way to, di to dismantle the sharpener and use the sharp edge of the sharpener to cut themselves and, and harm themselves. And me trying to explain uh, how that's not okay, what I ended up doing is, so they live in a constant state of uh, fight or flight. Um, their mortality salience is always at yep. work. So I made them feel like, okay, so this is your friend. And, and they would cut each other. So, sorry, his friend would, would uh, sit in front of him and he would get the razor and he would cut for his friend. He's helping them. And then they would do it for each other. So I told him if, if someone from the other village or the other side uh, came and tried to hurt your friend or tried to hit him, what would you do? He was like, oh, I'd protect him. I'd beat them up. I wouldn't let them. This is my friend. If they hurt him, they hurt me. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, 
was the same thing when you're talking about your own self-harm and that because we all have like bullies living in our minds as well and we sometimes we are our biggest bully but just putting it into perspective into their language kind of shifted the narrative a little bit because sometimes you know when NGOs go to certain countries and they try to help them they're trying to impose their own western principles or their western ideologies yeah. and how they view freedom or uh, resilience and whatnot but actually I'm glad you brought this up a friend of mine very near dear to my heart as well too that brought something on a while back we was just chatting she had actually was in Africa at some point in Kenya helping out kids and what have you and she said something to me that really kind of resonated with what you're saying who am I this white girl trying to you know impose my traditions and what would I have you on this African mama and tell her how she should be raising the kids kind exactly of thing, so and it creates an identity crisis to these people sometimes because they're very vulnerable and they see you as their savior. Maybe they have an inferiority complex or, or attachment issues and, and they form this uh, dependent relationship with you because it's the first time that someone is, is speaking to them on, on this level and you have a huge level of influence when you're dealing with someone who's been traumatized or who's, who's in that vulnerable position. So that's why we need to be very careful and discreet. And I believe unless you're coming from a multicultural background academically or personally, you should not be doing like, cross racial therapy uh, because we're biased, whether we like it or not, no matter how many experiences you have or how much training you go through, you're going to be biased to a certain extent. 100%. And it's always a certain kind of bias, right? Like it depends on where you were raised, uh, what you bring to the table, the way that you were raised. It's all different. With that being said, I just want to kind of touch a little bit on why did you get into all of this in the stuff? Like what alerted Aya way back in the day to go, you know what, this is the career path I want to choose. <laughs> to answer that question with full honesty, I think I'm going to have to go through some type of hypnosis mm -hmm. because I was in grade three and we, we had a, an assignment to write what we wanted to do and who we wanted to be. And I wrote, I want to be a psychologist and I want to open a mental health institute and I want to help people and I want to build communities. I was in grade three. I mm. still have that paper till this day. But I think... I think one of the biggest thing that engraved engraved it into my identity was my father taking me with him to volunteer all the time. It was our thing. It was what we would do. My friends would go shopping, but my dad would take me volunteering. And we, we would live with these communities and, and it, it developed such a deep sense of, of gratitude, but it also created a sense of purpose for me. And I'm, I'm very lucky and very grateful that I know what my purpose is in life. I know what my passion is. Mm -hmm. It is when I feel the most alive. And for five years, I worked without making a dime. I was just volunteering. I wasn't even in school yet. I entered university already having a career behind me. Um, and it just, it just became part of who I am. And it's a cliche, but I do love helping people. And what's interesting is that our brain is wired in a way that when, and I was just reading it this morning, is that when we perform acts of kindness, it makes our brain feel the same way when we're receiving it. It's actually, for me at least, it always feels better. There you go. Even better. And it's it's an immune booster. It's a mood booster. It's a cognitive booster. Uh, so yeah, maybe it, it, there is some sort of selfishness in it. But I mean, what better way to be selfish? Than to they say like, like whenever you're going through a rough time, if you stop focusing on what's going on with you and start focusing on helping others, yeah, you completely like just you're it's, it's, getting yourself out of it. It's healing. And you know, the, there's the longest study that was ever done on happiness concluded that the best source of happiness we have is from good quality relationships. So even if you're going through depression and anxiety, not to undermine the effect of medication or uh, clinical therapy, but you having a sense of community uh, and support, whether it's family or friends or just, you know, the general society that you live in is one of the biggest things that you, that you can use to help combat mental health issues like depression and anxiety and even schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. That's how deep it goes. So, I mean, if you, you're building the community, you're being part of the solution, what a better way to live. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, why do you think mental health is the most important or pivotal part of our human evolution? You can kind of break it down to the definition of mental health. You know, when we talk about mental health, we're talking about psychology um, and kind of your identity as well. Um, and what affects your identity is the experiences you go through, the family you're born in, the situation you're born in. So it's a mixture of experiences, opportunities, environment, uh, emotions, and thoughts. So when we talk about psychology, it's making sense. Of all of the cluster of all those things, why we act the way we act, why behave, why we behave this way, so kind of 
you can't solve the problem if you don't know the root cause. Yeah. You're going to keep going on doing the same thing over and over, stuck in your uh, kind of comfort zone or the way you're used to doing things, which is the definition of insanity. You're doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different a different result. Uh, yeah, result. Sure. So when we kind of reflect and go back into the depth of our why, that's how you kind of realize what the problem is and that's how you could solve it and change it. And you could rewire your brain even. So it's not that, oh, I have a predisposition to this depression runs in the family or whatnot so I, I'm doomed I'm hopeless what can I do about it no you can literally rewire your brain through things as simple as mindfulness mm -hmm. uh, biggest one from like again experience from the military and stuff like that is it's uh, the sense of like just kind of emerging yourself into mm. something like for example um, some of the war warriors that come back you know crazy war zone stories all of that stuff sometimes just putting them back into it is not really helpful yeah but simulating that and then showing them that it's still okay through mindfulness, through, you know, like the breathing exercises, all of that stuff, it kind of brings them back into reality. Like, I'm still alive. Things are still okay. Yeah. I can still, you know, function. What are some of the common themes that you've noticed throughout the years as far as mental health issues? I think the biggest mental health issues that we have right now are depression and anxiety. And the difficult thing is right now with, you know, the globalization and social media, seeing this huge trend of speaking on mental health issues, which is great sometimes, but it's also uh, damaging at other times because you have all these unqualified people uh, creating all these notions and giving all these solutions that may or may not work depending on your uh, situation. Mm -hmm. But the biggest reason I think most of us suffer from mental health issues is a mixture of gender roles traditional gender roles and society expectations. So according to research, one in three women have depression and one in five men have depression. Do I think that's accurate? No. I think that men have a uh, much higher stigma. Society has a certain expectation of them. They have certain gender roles that are imposed on them. And that's why a lot of men are going through intense mental health issues and no one knows about it. Sometimes they don't even acknowledge it themselves. And that's why they have a higher rate of suicide, heart problems, yeah. cardiac arrest issues, etc. Because they can't even talk about it. And sometimes that is all you need. You just need to have a conversation and a safe space and just talk about it, hear yourself think, all these knots that are in your brain, just help it be a little untied. And sometimes the person wants to talk not for advice, not to get a solution, just to talk. Let it out, yeah. Just to let it out. It's, it's funny that you say this because like when you look at suicide rates for men and women, men obviously a lot higher oh, than yeah. women. Oh, yeah. And then also the sort of like the, the way it is done with men, it's a lot more aggression, a lot more, you know, like for example, like it's, it's very rare to see women shooting themselves. Yeah. But you see that in men all the time. It's very rare to see women maybe hanging themselves. They might, you know, take the easier route. And I'm not saying it's just the way because, again, because of the whole gender role thing. It's just yeah. affecting how they believe and behave. And it's not just that. If you look at the media, they've romanticized female suicide, which is crazy. Like, I have goosebumps just thinking about it. When you think of, like you, think of a woman committing suicide right now. What did you think about? What did you see? The first thing I think was Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet. Marlon Monroe, Whitney Houston. And all you think about is this woman doing her makeup, wearing a nice dress, putting on perfume, swallowing a couple pills. Her hair is done and she lies in bed and she dies and you come and you find her. Mm -hmm. what, what is like Snow White. That's, in, that's, that's diabolical that we've romanticized female suicide. Yeah. And then when it's men... It's more of like, oh, it's a wake-up call. This is when the family was transformed. This is when the generational curses were broken. Oh, so we need to get there to acknowledge that there is a problem. Um, but it's also that when men commit suicide, they, they, they're sure of that decision. Sometimes, and I, I really apologize if this is triggering to anyone, but sometimes teenagers or children or women do it out of attention hoping that someone's going to find them. So you take the pill or you, you do sit in the bathtub and it's, it's a slower death. Maybe my, my lover is going to find me or the people yeah. that care are going to find me. And if they don't, then that's not a life that I want to live. So they're kind of like still giving themselves that slight chance of hope. But with men, they have reached a point of hopelessness where they're done and they don't care if someone's going to find out or not. They don't usually warn people or, you know, write that letter. They just... Take, exactly. They take their life away. And it, it is a little bit triggering. I'm not going to lie. It, it brings up some memories with one of my best friends back in uh, right. back home who I, I, I idolized. Like he was maybe three years older than me. I idolized him. And I uh, used to work with his dad as well too, like learn how to become a mechanic back. I was actually one of the people that found him. 
Oh my God. We were looking for him for like a good couple of days and we found him on the roof of his house hanging himself. With that being said, he was going through a lot of mental issues. And now looking back at it, looking back at some of the things that I've learned over the years about mental health, it could have been avoided. Oh yeah. You know, like if, if the parent knew a little bit more, it could have been avoided. So what are your thoughts on education and, you know, building awareness? What would be the ideal in your opinion? So one of the biggest, let's talk about Canada. Canada is uh, not a third world country. Uh, it's one of the most countries that cares about mental health. Like in 2018, before COVID even happened, uh, the government allocated $5.1 billion uh, for mental health, but that was only covering 3% of uh, medical spending. Mm -hmm. uh, but that being said, one of the biggest reasons people don't uh, seek therapy is a lack of awareness and lack of uh, knowing where the resources are. So sometimes the resources are there, but they don't know where to find them. And another thing is also the cultural or language barrier. So you've got the service providers, but there's no bridge uh, between them and the people needing these services. And most of the time in countries like Canada, it's the people that are the running away from an unsafe situation, seeking a safer one over here. And, and that being said, tying it down back to education, it's also about breaking down the stigma, which is also why we started the podcast, yeah. raising that awareness. Because you could you could bring the best service in the world, but if people don't, if the right people that need it don't know about it, you're really not solving the problem. Uh, so education is very important, not just when it comes to in terms of service providers, but also in terms of self, your sense of self, and that goes again tying it back to agency, resilience, taking ownership of your own healing. Because mm -hmm. if you don't want to help yourself, no one in the world can help you. So having that kind of like self knowledge and that little toolbox that you could tap back into every time yeah. you need is essential. And it's also helpful because you take that into the relationships that you're forming into the family that you're building you in your job, like you as a teacher, recognizing that this student may be coming from an unsafe home, might be coming from a disruptive household. Maybe I can help. Maybe I can get involved. Yeah. So I think everyone, everyone in the community, it's essential that they have some sort of knowledge, some sort of base and foundation for when it comes to mental health intervention. It's really evident, like in the last, uh, I want to say, seven to eight years here in Canada that, you know, a lot of talks about mental health, a lot of people are just kind of, uh, you know, going out and saying like, yeah, I've had a depression. Or, yeah, I've had, you know, some issue in the last, you know, four or five years. What's been happening, and I, I find it's kind of cool that it's, it's going this route, is a lot of people that are famous, mm. that are out there, just kind of, they're making it, they're taking the stigma away, in a way. They're making it more accessible. They're making it more normal. Yeah. To talk about it. Yeah. Normalizing the fact that, look, at the end of the day, we're human. This is a very complicated machine up here. And sometimes we just need, like you said, we need someone to just help us out, untie those knots that we have. Yeah. Uh, so it's not, it's not loss on, on what the government has been doing, but I feel like there's a lot more to be done here. Oh yeah. hundred percent. We have a huge demand and not enough uh, services to suffice that demand and it's not only uh, when it comes to mental health it's also when we talk about intellectual disabilities because I work in, in the, that sector as well and we see so many individuals that have intellectual disabilities but don't qualify for services because their case is not as severe mm -hmm. but then it's like why are we just working on intervention why are we not focusing on prevention because you know mental health issues and disabilities are costing the government billions of dollars because you're not just talking about the issue you're also talking about loss of income income um a decreased quality of life yeah. you an intervention costs more than prevention in the long term 100 percent. like I, i'm again using my own experience i remember a while back i actually take i took maybe two and a half months off work and it was all mental health like i just all i wanted to do is i wanted to work on myself figure out what's going on with me um that costed my employer two and a half months of work yeah i mean but, thank god we have that but exactly but imagine if I had just like that prevention was available for me before uh, the hotlines, they were only started. Like when I started taking the time off, that's when those hotlines started to come out and, mm. and things like that. If those were available before, that could have been prevented. What was your wake up call? When did you realize that, oh, I need help. I have a problem. Um, I came in one day and it was like a really dark time of my life where I thought I was going to kill myself. Oh my God. Well, I'm glad you didn't. And luckily, I, I had the foresight of just, you know what, calling my partner at the time and say, like, I need to go to the hospital. Oof. So it happens. But why? And at the end of the day, like, there's nothing wrong with us. I mean, and this is one of the things that we need to kind of bring out and let people know, like, look, there's nothing wrong with us that thinking this way. But what's wrong with us is, like, not seeking help, 
And sometimes we're, we're not able to seek help because we think it's taboo, we think it's wrong, we think it's, it's we something can't that acknowledge we, that it's we a can't talk about. And the reason being is because for years and years and years, society kind of looked upon people with mental health that you're crazy. You're preconditioned to, to think that the minute your mind or your heart needs a break or that you want to seek help you're preconditioned to understand that that means you're not an equipped human being as much as everyone else around you yeah. uh, and then you have all these people walking around with all these issues and it doesn't go away that's the thing when you don't work on your trauma or the mental health issues that you're going through it's never going to go away it might come out in your body as physical illness stress is one of the, the biggest uh, causes of death in the world. And, and the biggest reason of stress is you, you're going through a traumatic experience and not uh, working on it or going through it. But not just that. The unhealthy coping mechanisms can go as far as you transforming that and passing it down onto your children and the people around you. Yeah. And then, you know, you wake up one day and you're 40 and your children don't talk to you and they can't form a healthy relationship. And everyone's like, oh, why? How did we get here? Yeah. And they think of it as, oh, it's anger. He's just an angry person. This is what's happening. But really, it's, I guess it's anger with resentment, with guilt, with shame, shame, with so many different things. And it embodies itself with you're just being a complete a-hole. And, and it's like seeking help is such a beautiful thing. And being vulnerable is transformative to communities because the minute you do that, it's like a domino effect. 100%. And then everyone around you starts having this yeah. conversation. And that's why I encourage people who want to get into the field of mental health to do it because if you're able to change one person's life, transform this one person from this little experience, they're going to go ahead and change three people around them. And those three people will change the people around yeah. them. You're building better communities. I think by far like that experience for me was the biggest eye opener I've ever had in my life about mental health. And about just being vulnerable, like deciding to be vulnerable. I no longer want to be this rock. You know what I mean? And again, I come from trauma, war, all of that stuff. But did you feel less of a human or didn't you feel more connected to who no, you are as a person? I felt a lot more connected. In fact, if you ask any of my friends, my friendship with them changed significantly in the last eight years or so because of that, because of the fact that I'm just like more vulnerable with them. Mm. I just put myself out there. I don't care what they say. At the end of the day, this is what I'm feeling. This is what's going on. You take it or you don't, I don't care. And I'm sure one of them, when they go through something, you're the first person they're going to call and open up to because 100%. you've already taken that initiative. So they're like, oh, this is a safe space. This is a no judgment, no shame, guilt-free zone, which is difficult for a man. 100%. Yeah. 100%. It's actually one of the things as well I wanted to bring up about being difficult for men. When you look at, for example, rape, and I'm, I'm you know, I hope this doesn't trigger anybody. Trigger but warning. When it comes to rape, for example, men, 99% of the time, they don't report it. Oh, yeah. That's a massive, massive, you know, when you look at it, it's a massive statistic, right? That men go through this trauma and they don't report it because of the shame, the guilt, and, and how they felt about it. And they just don't want to be looked at against stigma. They they'll get emasculated, at. even if it's just sexual assault, not just rape. They'll immediately get emasculated. Mm -hmm. um, and then they, they think it doesn't, some men don't even know that that term exists for men. They don't think that men get raped, like... And there are so many stories, if, if you even look at NYPD, like we're talking about a modern country, a lot of men, I read an article, a lot of men that went to report sexual assault or rape, the cops, they're just laughed at them. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm sure you liked it. You should have like, oh, you're lucky. What are you complaining about? Like, it's crazy. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if they were, you know, like if, if they experienced that from a male or a female, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Oh, it's yeah. It's still a sexual assault. It's still some sort of... And then a, a lot of times it happens for them as children, like a lot of... The, the males that I've worked with as well, their first sexual experiences were with females that were a lot older than them. And as they narrate their experience, I'm like, that was not consensual. Mm -hmm. That was not sex. That was rape. That was assault. Yeah. But they don't, they don't even realize that. And then, you know, you, sometimes the coping mechanism is identification with the aggressor. So you identify with that and then you become that. And then they, they go out in society and they reenact that. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, that's the abuser, that's the problem. Uh, but then it's like, not to excuse that behavior, it's inexcusable, but then let's kind of dial back a little bit and see the root cause. Maybe we can do something to eliminate it. Maybe sexual education, having it not look as this huge taboo, or maybe also not making it look to men as it's this like victory that you wear on your chest. Like, oh yeah, how many women were you with? How, how old were you when you had your first experience? It's just kind of changing the notion of the way that we view things um, and what we're teaching our children because these voices are going to be internalized. These voices are going to live in their mind and sometimes it's engraved in their identity and who they are. 
Yeah. One of the things that I can identify with specifically with this is like that sense of just being who you are when it comes to mental health. I find a lot of the times we just don't, you know, we like, we, we just don't talk about it enough. So how do we raise awareness for the audience? Like what are some of the resources that they can, you know, seek out there that you could maybe share? Um, I think the first thing that we could do is start talking. So start talking about our experiences, uh, start talking about what we're going through, uh, and just sharing. You know, it's it's an act of kindness, it's an act of service. It helps us and it helps the person in front of us. Mindfulness is huge. We've already mentioned this because you don't necessarily need a therapist. Uh, you don't have to, maybe you can't pay for it, maybe you can't access it. But mindfulness is just a way to reroute our brain and create the safe space in our mind and this is this is something that I've done with people who have uh, survived trauma this is also an exercise that we've tried together before as well it's just you you close your eyes and you do the deep breathing then a couple times as many times as you need to sit comfortably preferably you have not eaten a huge meal uh, before that and then you just close your eyes and you dive in and you go to the safe space it could be anything to you it could be an unfinished conversation it could be an unresolved story or it could be just a place that makes you feel a certain way or childlike nostalgia and you just sit there and you start acknowledging and feeling all of your senses from the smell to the taste to the sounds and you just stay there for as long as you need focusing on your breathing reenacting that in your mind and then you slowly come back and what I like to do at the end of it is just you rub your hands and you put your head in between your hands and it's that physical touch that increases gray matter in your brain as well which is the part of the brain that helps you feel pleasure and safety um, and happy and you know that's the way to kind of like calm down get away from whatever you're going through in the moment go back to that safe space every time that you need journaling is helpful for a lot of people but then you also need to talk about lifestyle uh, as long as you're exercising you're eating well uh, our brain loves nature loves green spaces music sometimes just hugging the people around you and that physical touch and you know having a pet um, yep. just doing things that you enjoy for this for the sake of enjoying it not because you have to just because it feels good and little by little your brain will develop this muscle memory and it'll just become a habit that's going to help you not just solve whatever is going through you're going to be more resilient you're going to develop healthier coping mechanisms so it's not just i've had a rough day let me pour a glass of wine um, or have a cigarette or go to the club like that's like a little band-aid but the minute that goes away you're back feeling even worse than how you felt to it's begin a lot with worse because it's depressant right wine going out you know like that that hit dopamine hit that you get it's just all it does is just like uh, brings you up a little bit but it's then a rush you're gonna come you're, right back you're addicted to it and you want to do it again do it again and then this is one of the reasons why some people develop addictions they develop you know like uh, misuse of, of uh, for example like drugs and things like that so I find the biggest one as well, too, is uh, for me, at least, one of the, the, the things that I've learned was labeling your feelings. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? No, I definitely agree with you. Um, it, it's a form of self-awareness. Uh, and you're labeling your feelings. You're like, In this moment, this is how I feel. This is what I need to do. This is my, my coping mechanism. This is my safe space. Mm -hmm. Like I used to have anger issues. I actually went to anger management when I was 18. <laughs> you don't tell. <laughs> <laughs> of course I don't. But, you know, I realized, okay, here's a problem. And then uh, what's, what's good with labeling your feelings is that you could start to kind of predict, okay, this is how I'm starting to feel. These are my triggers. These are the symptoms. I'm going to go to a dark place if I don't stop right yeah. now and take a step back. So then, and like that pattern interrupt. Like, no, exactly. I'm feeling this way because of this. Here's what I'm going to do to change it. Exactly. I'm going to walk away. You can eliminate, mm. you can start eliminating where you don't have to be in a constant state of fight or flight. You don't have to constantly find yourself in these situations and have like a combative reaction. You could kind of foresee it, predict it and eliminate as much as you can out of your life. So, you know, I don't have to be in a r complete rage fit seeing red <laughs> for me to leave. I can know this is my trigger. I can acknowledge it. Mm. I accept it. It doesn't mean, you know, like I'm bad or I'm uh, less of a uh, person. No, I can acknowledge this is my trigger. I'm yeah, and sometimes out. it's situational, sometimes it's people as well. Yeah. Right, like sometimes this particular situation is going to bring me into a rage or this particular situation is going to make me really angry or sad or whatever. Same goes with people. Sometimes this particular <laughs> person is going to tick me off oh, yeah. and here's why. Well, what can I do to kind of avoid that yeah. in a way? 
And mental health, this is a, the other thing too that people think though, sometimes mental health is just like you're you're crazy or you're like psycho or this. Sometimes it's just how people make you feel. Yeah. And maybe changing that, changing the situation or changing the, uh, the, the environment that you're in could actually take you out of that. It's, it's also a little bit of self-actualization and this is where intentionality comes in which is very important which is like understanding why we're doing this this is the thought that I have this is what I want to achieve so this is why I'm going to do it mm-hmm. um, and just having that higher purpose and that greater thing that you belong to gives you a sense of calmness and, and you know the self-actualization is kind of reaching the highest point of your identity and that continuity and that unity that you have uh, within yourselves or with others and that's how you could start deciding what type of relationships you want to form and what relationships are healthy for you because now we have a common goal now we we serve this specific thing and you help me keep myself in check and i'll help you keep yourself in check and you know it's 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 a give and take and it's not bad to have a codependent relationship when it's a healthy one and we're yeah. keeping each other on on the right track so one of the questions that come to mind when it comes to you know emotional intelligence how do they vary between emotional intelligence and mental health what's sort of like the, the you know that the relationship they're related they're definitely related emotional intelligence ties back to the thing that we were just talking about as well it's the intentionality the awareness uh knowing why you feel this way going back to what you said also about what, the triggers that you have and also me just knowing that this makes me feel good i've had a rough day i'm feeling that i'm at a 70 percent. i'm at a 30 percent today this is what i need to do mm-hmm. to bring myself back to the the state that i that i want to be in but not just that emotional intelligence helps you understand that sometimes the way people are acting is a reflection of how they feel about themselves it's yep. not necessarily your fault you're not the problem you're not always the trigger and a lot of us tend to blame ourselves especially when it comes to family or relationships and one of the the, the scariest things is internalizing that so if you're in a relationship with a narcissist who is incapable of admitting uh, a wrongdoing and is trying to control you and possess you and make you feel as fault and make you feel down so that they can keep you around Emotional intelligence is you recognizing that pattern, recognizing that this person needs help. Mm-hmm. It's not just an evil person or it's not my fault and, and you know, I'm, I'm doomed in relationships. It's this person's been traumatized. This person has gone through, maybe they had a narcissist parent as well. Yeah. Uh, I can understand, but I don't have to take it. No, 100%. I mean, hurt people always hurt people. That's just the way it is. It's, it's not in always. A um, in, in a way, in a way. And it goes back to an Arabic term where we say, mm-hmm. But also, I like to say, man So you could look at children that come from emotionally unavailable. Maybe we'll try to, if you don't mind, we'll try to go back to that and just yeah, yeah. translate it a little bit. So, uh, means the person, when you have a lack of something, you can't give it. So yeah. if you come from a home that had a lack of love or compassion, you are incapable of feeling that emotion or giving that emotion. But I like to say that, no, when you lack something, sometimes you overcompensate and you're the most one that gives it mm-hmm. because your empathy and your emotional intelligence puts you in a spot where you don't want anyone else to feel that way ever again. Yeah. So you have you have children that come from uh, parents that were emotionally unavailable, who might have been also physically abusive uh, and emotionally abusive. They don't necessarily become an abuser and repeat the same pattern. Sometimes they do. But sometimes they're the complete opposite. opposite yeah. But they've done the work. They've done the work. So they've let me take it back then. Hurt people don't always hurt people. And... The reason why is if they've actually worked on themselves. Exactly. Or ha- or having that uh, that emotional intelligence. You don't want anyone else to feel that way ever again. You're breaking the cycle. Um, it doesn't have to stay this way. It doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to have all these adults walking around with broken children inside of them. Mm-hmm. And then them repeating the pattern because they don't want to open the can of worms and work on themselves. You should not have children before you go to therapy or before you try to kind of, you know, get a self-help book. You don't want to speak to a therapist. You don't trust the therapist. Get a self-help book. Yeah. Read. Watch the documentary. And, you know, start journaling and seeing what's going on. I was going to ask you. I'm glad that you brought this up. Because I was going to ask you about some of the free, you know, self-help. Or, uh, you know, seeking sort of uh, mental health assistance ways out there that you could recommend what would that be one of the easiest things and now it's coming to mind because we were watching it yesterday uh, you could uh, go, go on master class it, it costs what $13 a month $13 a month mm-hmm. watch a master class uh, there are so many free resources out there just go to google scholar and just literally type in the problem that you have depression anxiety uh, attachment issue uh, just anything go to google scholar write it down 
read a couple of articles. You're going to find an article that resonates with you. You're going to find something that makes you feel a certain way, hits a certain nerve, you're going to get a little emotional. Read that. That's bringing your suppressed emotions from your unconscious to your conscious, making the unconscious conscious. Yeah. It's kind of helping you understand the, the pattern that you've had for so long, the autopilot. So you're coming back from autopilot to kind of becoming more aware and cry, let it out, you know, yeah. go through the, the feelings, remember the bad memories, they're, they're going to come back. So honestly, whatever you're going through right now, don't suppress it. Don't brush it under the rug because it's going to come back and bite you and it's going to be a lot stronger uh, than it was before. So yeah, self-help books, masterclass, friends, the relationships that you have right now, call your friends and talk to them, you know, have that conversation, ask for help, but also offer help. Question on that though, friends. Sometimes friends can be good influence. Sometimes it can be bad influence. How do you know that this specific friend you're safe to talk to? Honestly, you never know. I would say trust your intuition. But also a friend is someone who not only you could go to and, and, and cry on their shoulder, but it's also the person that when you tell them about the good stuff, they're your biggest cheerleader. And they're, they're holding you accountable. So a friend is not just the person that's always clapping for you, cheering you on, telling you you're right. You know, like us girls, we go and we complain about our significant others. And, you know, our girlfriends are just like, yeah, dump him. He's a piece of garbage. <laughs> no, hold yourself. Friends are people that hold you accountable and tell you you're the problem here it's kind of like the voice of reason yeah. that you need when you're unable to think clearly makes sense one last point before we kind of conclude with this what are your biggest sort of advice that you want to give people about mental health and how can they embody that every day be honest with yourself that little conversation that you're putting off between you and yourself have it um that ugly face in the mirror that you don't want to see Look stare at it, it. Yeah. look at it because imagine this like where would fatty have been if 20 years ago fatty had those difficult conversations that he did not want to have if that difficult decision that you knew you had to make but you kept putting off and putting off and putting off hoping that things are going to resolve themselves until you finally had no choice you were mm -hmm. backed up in a corner imagine if you went 20 years back and you made those decisions <clears throat> and you had those conversations and you cut off those people uh, or you acknowledged those goals and started working, where would you have been today? Um, for starters, it would have not robbed me out of time. There you go. And, and, and regret is a very bitter poison yeah. and it's a very hard pill to swallow and you can't run away from it but you know it's it's never too late but that's why you know we need we absolutely need to have those conversations um, and Pain is, is, is good sometimes and, you know, we, we need it. We need to have those burdens. We all have a certain burden that we need to carry. Yeah. But, you know, if you didn't carry it and if that's not what you're going through, then what is the meaning of life? 100%. I like how you said pain sometimes is something that we need to sit in and feel. 100%. Because if it, it's a good sort of indicator that, okay, if I'm feeling something, I'm alive, first of all. Exactly. And then two... I get to kind of work on it. Now that I'm feeling it, I get to embody it. I get to somehow, you know, put it in perspective and embody it and come out and say, this is wrong. This is affecting me because of this. And it's making me feel this way. And that could be anger. That could be hurt. That could be anything. And I'm going to do this to fix it. Kind of thing. Yeah. And, and also something that's very important is that when we start doing that with ourselves, we start applying that with the partners and the people that we choose in our life um, as well. Uh, because your partner is someone who's also going to hold you accountable. Your partner is someone that's going to, you know, live life with you. And the way you're treating yourself is the way you're allowing your partner to treat you. So if you have a toxic relationship with yourself, you might have a toxic a relationship with your significant other. You might, you guys might have developed a trauma bond and you're both going around hurting each other, hurting your children, passing down generational trauma because you refuse to have those conversations. Yeah. And that relationship, like if, if you are having a relationship like that, it's it's not really healthy. What you need to have is a safe space. Oh, yeah. And, and, and let's put mental health on the side. Biologically speaking, your brain and body start sinking into the heartbeat and breath rate of your partner. And a mom also passes that down to her child. So if she has an anxiety, the child will have an anxious attachment. So it's not just about, oh, we don't fight in front of our children. No, no, no. Your children can feel that. They, they sense your heart rate, they sense your breathing rate, and that is then passed down 
onto them. So it's also very important, you know, the partners that we choose. But if you're not doing the work on yourself, you're going to get a partner who has not done the work on themselves as well. 100%. And I find when you're with a partner that has worked on themselves, you feel a sense of peace. Peace and safety. We could go about this and talk for <laughs> hours and hours and hours. Something that I'm really passionate about, mental health is something that had really just kind of changed my life upside down in the last seven or eight years or so. And I'm very passionate about it. I would love to kind of, you know, keep watching the, the shows that you have, your podcast, and I would invite the audience as well to subscribe for it. And really appreciate it. You've been on the show, making the time for us. We've been thank you for having me. Trying Friday. to do this for quite some time now. Uh, thank you guys. Really, uh, guys, appreciate it. If you like what you see, hit the like icon and make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon as well too so you can get more and more episodes about this and you know don't be afraid mental health at the end of the day it's one of the most pivotal thing in your life work on it thank you again